going back to the exam experience, like I remember, you know, leading up to first year exams, it was like the study groups were such a big thing. Like you need to find your study group. You need to be with your study group. And I'm sure that was not a thing. No, not at all. There's no mention. Like I didn't even hear about it. <laughs> I've only heard about it from, from other lawyers who graduated <laughs> in the past. <laughs> Welcome to The Defense Never Rests with Morgan and Akins, your monthly dose of uncommon sense about all things legal and some that are not. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of The Defense Never Rests. I'm your host today, Megan Henry, and I'm joined by my co-host, Wendy Smith. How are you, Wendy? Good. Hi, Megan. Hi, everyone. So today we have on a very special guest. Well, we have a very special guest on every week, but this week uh, we have on Ted Holleran, who happened to be our summer legal intern. Um, so today's his last day. So he is coming on to talk about, you know, his experience with us this summer. Um, I will say, I think this is our first time having a summer associate, right, Wendy? Yes. Yeah. So he came on as a summer associate during a pandemic. Um, so an interesting experience for him, but he also went through his first year of law school during a pandemic. So we thought it'd just be interesting to, to bring him on, talk about everything he went through the last year and so, and you know, how his summer was. So with that said, let's bring him in. Hey, Ted, welcome. Thanks for joining us this afternoon on the Defense Never Rest. I'm so happy to have you. Thanks for having me. Um, for our listeners and our viewers, Ted was our summer intern and today is his last day. So we thought it would be really fun to bring him on, um, and ask him about his experiences, uh, throughout the summer and just, you know, his experiences as a, as a law student now and during COVID. So he graciously, um, grant, graced us with his appearance. So, so happy to have, have you paid him a little money to say how wonderful our firm was and how his wonderful mentor it's the was best this firm summer. in the whole <laughs> wide world and wendy's <laughs> number one and everything is really good well we don't want to, all our guests to think that only ted was getting paid and they didn't get anything <laughs> but um but before we dig into, you know, your experience this summer at, and law school, I, I just want to get a little background because uh, I always find it interesting to hear about everyone's journey and why they decided to choose the path that they're on. So, you know, what what brought you to make the decision to go to law school? Was it something that you always wanted to do? Did you fall into it? Um, did someone tell you you should do it? <laughs> How did it work? I guess I just started thinking about it towards the tail end of college and thought it'd be really interesting and thought it was important also. And those two things intersected. So it was good enough to be worth the time. What was your major in college? Yeah. My major in college was uh, classical studies. Oh, so so law school was probably a wise choice because I don't know a lot of people working in the classical studies market. Well, there's a, there's a pope. The pope <laughs> talks in Latin and uh, some probably some tour guides around the Coliseum. But that'd be extent. Yeah. Uh, so how did and did you go straight to law school from from undergrad? Yeah. OK. And how, how did you find the transition into law school from undergrad? Because for some people, it's like no biggie. Others, it's like a big slap in the face. Well, that cuts back to the main topic, because the big <laughs> transition for me was uh, school versus the, the computer. <laughs> right. The Zoom school of law. So when well, when you graduated, um, college you did you graduate remotely as well yeah okay yeah. um and where did you go to college went to villanova okay mm -hmm. um and then you're at law school i forget where where do you at, go to law school? i go to drexel's law school oh that's right so how was it coming in, well graduating virtually and then coming into your first you know your first 1l year to be all online ah uh, it's not like really that much to report it's the same thing everyone else experienced like everything was on the computer everyone's work was on the computer everyone's like court hearings were on the computer and it's the same thing with graduation and school like you still sit in the same chair and just look into this rectangle and try to act like it's normal and that you're in the physical presence of the people you're talking to but we're not this is this is just some weird communication system we have set up <laughs> so ted a lot of times, like, especially like before when we went to law school, I think everybody has an idea of what law school would look like. So did you know going into law school before, if this hadn't been COVID, did, what would be, what was your idea of what you thought law school would be? Uh, I probably based it off of college and I figure it'd be 
maybe the same as college, but with less of the math kids around. <laughs> and that seemed to line up from what I got on the computer. Do they still do what they call the Socratic method you, while you were? Yeah, the they try to do that, but it doesn't work. I don't know how well it worked out when it was in person, but over the computer, it definitely does not work. Because the teachers will do the surprise thing where they call on a kid and then he just doesn't turn on his microphone. (laughs) So it's a technical problem. Yeah. So it's the teacher who looks like the fool because they're left there talking to the void saying, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson. I will say the Socratic method, I think, worked very well in person because you were scared out of your mind to get called on and look like an idiot in front of everybody else if you didn't have the answer. (laughs) It worked for me, at least. Mm -hmm. I think I always liked when people thought, oh, they got picked on at the beginning of the class, like they got asked the question and they thought they were done and they were surprised that they got stayed on the whole entire class. Like Mm -hmm. that was their day. So it's incentive, I guess, to read your case law and be prepared for class. Yeah. So, I mean, I know a lot of people don't think of law school as being a, a social experience, but it certainly, at least for me, it, there, there was a fair amount of that social interaction. And you, you probably, I mean, you probably lost out on all of that. I mean, did you even know any of your classmates? No, I don't know them. <laughs> I have never been within six feet of them. I can't tell you what their faces look like because everyone's wearing a mask. And for the second semester, a lot of people were in two masks just to obscure the faces even more. Um, there were no, there were still clubs, but they were always online. I didn't go to them. It was just extra Zoom. After you already Zoomed out, they'd say, and you can come back at 5 p.m. for this club meeting. It's going to be over Zoom. No, I didn't go to them, so. I think the best thing that you told me about is that the libraries weren't open, so you actually went to parks Yeah, to go do your reading? They closed the libraries. I don't know where we're supposed to read. Like we need somewhere quiet and the libraries are closed and I'm outside on the city streets of Drexel. And I'm thinking, oh, I don't know where I could go. I can't go anywhere inside because everywhere is either closed or restricted. Uh, I'd get in the car and I head back home and I'm driving by a bunch of parks and I have my like casebook assignment in my head thinking I got to read 30 pages and the park is pretty quiet. So I just went over there and read it. It's nice. That doesn't sound so bad. No. <laughs> I never liked being in the library anyway. It ended up being more of a social scene too. <laughs> you just see everyone you knew and you'd start talking or whispering. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, as you come out, as you were going into your second year and you're going to be doing, I think, more in person, they're, mm-hmm. they're go back full person. What, what do you think your idea is going to be on second year? How different it's going to be? That's the question right now, because they've made uh, promises in the beginning of summer, and now they're providing us more details with what it's really going to look like. So it's definitely going to be different than last year. And last year was already different than all the prior years. So we're now going on a third unique law school experience. Um, but you did, you, you did go back part of the time in, in person in, in the spring, right? Yes, I had two classes that were in person. Uh, That was the ones where we would, we actually gathered in the largest classroom available on campus. So it was an engineer's lecture hall. That was just massive. We'd all walk in and we had to be spaced out and they would have some rows uh, caution taped off to keep us from sitting too close together. And the professor would be up there on the stage and they'd have their mask on and then the microphone. So it'd be like really like muffled. Um, and hopefully this year we'll actually be in a classroom and it'll be like better acoustics. Mm-hmm. That'd be nice. So how did exams work? I mean, I remember first year, at least for me, I, there, I don't, I think I, I don't think any of my classes had any sort of take home exam. So was it just completely on the honor system that you would, it um, wouldn't be open book if the, if that was the type of class it were? It was all open book, all open internet. I know some professors seemed like they weren't too happy about that and they had to revamp the final yeah, uh, because they were used to making kids memorize the rule against perpetuities or right. some wow. other list of elements or something. You know, in a way, it kind of makes, it improves things in some respect because, I mean, 
in as lawyers, you don't ever rely on your memory to as to remember a rule. Well, you don't ever use the rule of perpetuities in, in practice, but what? <laughs> at least I have. <laughs> um, but I mean, you always look everything up. You never like even a rule of civil procedure. You always look it up just to make sure. So I've always questioned the the memorization aspect because in practice, I even though I know it's 20 days to answer a complaint and you know, in Pennsylvania, sometimes I still look it up just to make sure, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I, yeah. I think it's kind of, an, it even happened with the bar exam too, right? I think the bar exams this year were a lot of them, you know, you could look things up and I don't think it's a terrible thing because in practice, that's what you do. I just think it's funny sometimes, you know, it's been a while since I graduated law school, you know, and talking to somebody like Ted, you bring up like, you know, Torts, Mrs. Falkraft. They still teach that, you know, it's always like these iconic things or like Civ Pro. Everybody remembers 12B6. Mm -hmm. Out of all the rules you can file, preliminary objections or, or something similar to that, everybody always remembers like those same little rules. Mm -hmm. So I think it's funny that like even Cal to this day, you're still, they're still focusing in on all that stuff too. Well, yeah, it's all those classic cases that, you know, may have even formed, formed the rules that, you know, are still in place today. Oh, yeah. I remember <laughs> Paul's graph is the invention of duty. That's why we learn it. And in insurance, especially in the world of insurance defense, you know, you need to know negligence. That's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot there that aren't big ones, but <laughs> at least for us. Yeah. Um, so, you know, coming, well, actually, Going back to, so Drexel has like a different program though. You, you have, it, it's a co-op program, right? That you have a semester on and then a semester that you're supposed to work, correct? Yeah, they do offer that, but I'm not in it. I'm just in a normal three-year uh, oh. law school curriculum. Okay, I didn't realize they had like two different types. Yeah, they have a couple different. They have a, they even have a two-year program even. Oh. For law school? Yeah, for law school. That sounds like it would make a lot of sense just to squish it all in. Yeah, I think there's no summertime <laughs> since just like two straight years of nonstop law reading, lots of reading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, so going back to the exam experience, like I remember, you know, leading up to first year exams, it was like the study groups were such a big thing. Like you need to find your study group. You need to be with your study group. And I'm sure that was not a thing. No, not at all. There's no mention. Like I didn't even hear about it. <laughs> I've only heard about it from, from other lawyers who graduated in the past. I think I asked you that. I was like, did you have a study group? I probably I, needed you to explain to me what that is. Yeah. I said, yeah, that really just, at least in my experience, Megan, I don't know if it was yours, that that's really fell by the wayside, especially after your first semester of your first year. Yeah, it seems so important coming in. I think there was like all those books coming into law school, like you need to find your study group. And I think Legally Blonde came out and they had a study group in there. So you probably just thought that's what you're supposed to do. Well, I was talking about these things called horn books to Ted. I said, because I worked in the library when I was in law school. And I said, I remember, and if my former uh, law school roommate is listens to any of these podcasts, big shout out to her, but she got came back, we were in different sections with all these extra books, these horn books. Yeah. And the law books are not cheap, you know, and they're not, they're not light either. You know, I, I don't know now, I guess they, there's some online version of them, but you used to have to carry all these heavy books. And I'm like, what are those? And she said, horn books. And she bought all them. And I'm like, can't you get them in the library? Like, <laughs> yeah, but they're always taken out and stuff like that. I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> I work there. Weren't, but, aren't, weren't those the books that like explained you to explain you the law in like normal people terms? I think they were like additional. They also had like additional cases that you could read, like oh. in addition to your case book or whatever. Oh, Clearly, I again, like, like a lot of people didn't have them. And it was also an extra cost. But I said to Ted, I was like, do people still get horn books? Is that still, you okay. know, something they do? I, I, I don't know what a horn book is either. <laughs> I mean, I think part of it, you probably barely even need to get books. You probably just Google whatever cases you're going to read and you can just read them online. That is big for reviewing. 
Uh, yeah. I know me myself, I would read the signed chapters in the book, uh, maybe the night before and then before the class, you can Google it and usually there'll be like a summary somewhere there on the first page available. Yeah, that that probably helps. I, I had a whole like um, highlighter color system that now seems ridiculous. Like I, I wish I could have just done that. <laughs> it probably would have been a lot easier for me. <laughs> like I think pink was some meeting, yellow was some other meeting. I got myself crazy with highlighters. It's the OCD in me. Um, <laughs> but going back to, to exams, though, I mean, did you, I remember even taking out of just study groups. I remember, you know, studying at least with friends and like being able to challenge each other to make sure we understood what was going on. And I'm sure you didn't even have that experience. It was just, you, you run it on your own boat, like paddling your own ship. Yeah, you'd read it and then you'd talk about it when you were in class and the teacher was talking about it and then you'd go home and read the next thing. <laughs> Did you get a little lonely? <laughs> Not really, honestly. It was lonesome, but it wasn't lonely. It wasn't all bad. Um, so now that you're going back into semester two, like how are you feeling? I feel pretty good. I'm looking forward to going back to school. Overall, I really enjoyed it. Uh, the Zoom thing was something to adapt to in the beginning, but definitely warmed up to it. After a full year, you kind of just get into a pattern and a rhythm. It definitely helped having the two in-person classes and mm -hmm. really enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. Really felt like I learned a lot. I look forward to going back to learn some more. So what kind of classes are you taking this fall? I'm taking all the classics like criminal procedure and evidence. I took, I'm signed up for a real estate transaction class. And then I was, I was actually signed up for a corporate law class um, last week. And then I got an email from one of my, the deans who told me that's not a law class. And then I accidentally signed up for a class for uh, MBA students. <laughs> But you it, it, was, MBA too. it was under the same name. It were, there were three classes called corporate law. I wasn't supposed to know that two of them were law classes. The other one was an MBA class. Um, so take us through the, the summer. Um, I, I didn't get, have the pleasure of working with you this summer, but I know you, you worked along Wendy quite a bit, but how, how was your experience? Oh, it was great. I'm currently grateful for this. I felt like I got a little bit of everything. I really got to see, I got to do at least one like unit of each activity at the of what I would think of being at a law firm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what sort of things did you get to do without giving of, any client specific information or, you know, that sort of thing? Did a lot of research. I did a lot of writing, uh, some drafting. We got to, I uh, got to sit through depositions. They were pretty good. Um, did some other research that was about, like not particularly cases, but for uh, giving a lecture uh, at like a conference mm -hmm. or uh, for advertising purposes for the firm and like the different attorneys' abilities. Uh, yeah. um, I make that face about depositions because I remember sitting through depositions as a summer intern and I cannot think of a more boring thing to do, to sit through a deposition on a case that you don't know anything about, you're not asking any questions, and you just sit there and you take notes, like it, you're going somewhere with it, like just to do something. So I think it's very kind that you said it was really interesting, because that was not my experience. Some of them, that, there were definitely some like that, but most of them were pretty, were somewhat interesting. I mean, it's all new to you too, so I, there, and it, but I, I remember being like, oh, this is a long day. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's def there's a solid uh, lens of novelty surrounding everything. <laughs> yeah, that so, helps. Yeah. But you actually, so the way that we designed this, and I, I said like, you know, I have had the experience of doing summer programs at a different setting, a bigger setting, and not under COVID, you know, restrictions. But it's harder because you know we have courts that aren't opened. We're doing depositions by Zoom. Um, we're doing, you know marketing and stuff. So I really tried to gear this towards not only just doing like projects for different law practices, but trying to get you different aspects just of yeah. from admin to marketing to research um, and, you know, give you kind of a flavor of what we do in a very short setting. And, you know, you're not here every day. This is not a whole full summer program just because we're not open fully. But um, what was your favorite thing that you did? 
Honestly, this sounds like uh, it sounds like I'm a I'm a nerd or I'm a dork, but I really like the research. <laughs> it was fun. The research for the clients one? in the very beginning when I had to research highly reckless conduct. That one was like a little treasure map. Mm-hmm. Just having that slowly revealed to me. And each case, because it's all about highly reckless conduct, each case was pretty entertaining. They'd be like <laughs> describing scenes from Three Stooges movies. <laughs> Well, I will say I always really liked um, the research aspect uh, of practice because I loved getting into like the Westlaw hole that, you know, you just get lost in a land of research and then, you know, going through all the cases that that's something I always enjoyed. I don't get to do it really that much anymore or not to that same extent, Um, but I always found that to be fun because it's like, oh, I'm researching. (laughs) Let me go. Let me go do it. (laughs) <laughs> well you're doing something on drones to finish up oh yeah I, I just finished that i sent it off to him uh the rousing research piece on drones over prisons and there's not a lot of law about that so <laughs> it was a pretty tough to research <laughs> yeah there's not a lot of law on drones in general it's just a difficult it's a difficult treasure trove <laughs> to get some exact answers. Yeah. Well, that's, that's where, you know, I said, there's not always these issues that come up in cases that you have where there is clear cut law. In fact, I get questions. I got a question right before we jumped on podcast from a client asking about things that, you know, to do with like the pandemic and, you know, there's still a lot of uncharted practices and rules changed and it varies by jurisdictions out there. So you have to kind of piece it together in, in a particular way, but not having a whole lot of basis to that. So that's that, even though it's frustrating, I think, because you haven't had that practical experience, that that's, that's real, that's real practice. That's real law. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It happens so often that you, you know, you have an issue and is that it, I mean, sometimes it, so some may, some may have had that issue, but it doesn't mean it was decided by by the court. So you kind of have to do your best. <laughs> yeah, the drone thing is pretty interesting too because it was an example of something where it had yet to be legislated, but you can tell this would definitely be very illegal because, like, the hypothetical is: what if I put a bunch of cocaine on a drone and then drive it into a prison yard, and then I give all the prisoners a bunch of cocaine? Are there any laws about that? And it's, no, but. You still shouldn't do it, probably. Not probably. You shouldn't do it. (laughs) (laughs) You just got to go with that. Um, So going through the this experience this summer and like getting little tastes of litigation is is that an area you think you know you're interested in pursuing? Or it's too early to tell, and that's okay if it's too early. I think it's too early. I definitely have to explore more litigation. the one bout that we had actually in person in court that was exciting to be there but uh that was pretty quick and it was a little anticlimactic yeah well a lot mm. of it is it's not all law and order and you know whatever the... mm-hmm. <laughs> but i mean as a little bit of background for myself like i i'm in Italy, we're obviously working litigation now but this is never i never thought i'd be a litigator i always thought i'd be doing like contractual type work um and it just so happened when I graduated law school, the only jobs to be had were jobs in litigation. You know what? <laughs> you take what you can get. And now, now looking back, I couldn't imagine myself working in like corporate contracts or anything like that. I just, I like, I, I think that's definitely would not be the best road for me. So I kind of fell into it, but I think it was, you know, the best place for me. So, I mean, you might find that at the end of your, your tenure at, at law school, you'll find yourself at some place that it just like, it might not be something that you thought today that you would do and might be totally something totally different and it might be perfect for you. Mm. Or you could do something for several years and decide this isn't for me and then change. Oh. That happens too. <laughs> you know what guys, what I, what I really want to do is just write uh, legal thrillers that they sell at airports. I'm only at law school so I can do the John Grisham path. <laughs> well, that's not such a bad idea. <laughs> John Grisham also practiced law, though, for a little while before he went into the whole writing business. I'll give it a year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that, that's a little bit better than my, my, I had that side idea that I should write some chiclet and it hasn't happened yet. It's, st- it's so there's still a chance that I'm going to write my 
you know, bu- bubblegum stories. You're going to be like Stacy, Stacy um, Adams, Abrams down in Georgia yes. or whatever. She, yeah. So she's a big political figure, but she also writes romance novels. Ooh, yeah, that's what I want to do. Like under mm-hmm. like some ghostwriter name. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, wow. <laughs> uh yeah Wendy did you I I think we talked about this before but that you kind of knew you wanted to go into litigation right yeah I I've said I even told Ted I said when I was in law school I know the big thing after your first year is the law review Mm -hmm. getting the packet after you finish your first round of your last exam uh for the last semester of your first year everybody's rushing to go get these law review packets to do their writing submission to get on law review and not that that's not, you know, a, a prestigious thing to do or, and there's anything wrong with it. I just had no desire. Was it laziness? Was it anything? I just said no desire. I said, I, there's things I want to do. I said, I want to do trial team, which I couldn't try out in my school. You couldn't try out until um, second year mm-hmm. and like moot court. I always liked that aspect of it and did both. And I loved it. And so I always wanted, I knew I wasn't going to be a transactional attorney said there were two types of law I didn't have an interest in too much in, um, criminal or family. Yeah. But other That's than a, that. That is a common thing. There's some, a lot of people are like, I cannot do, you know, family law or, you know, it just, I think there's just certain people it works for and others that, it, you know, it just doesn't work. Is there, Ted, is there anything that you, right now you're thinking absolutely not, or you don't want to put it on the record just in case? Uh, <laughs> similarly, <laughs> I'm not too interested in family law. And I find so many other fields so much more interesting. Uh, I wouldn't even think to do something like that. Yeah, I mean, I had friends who who did it and enjoyed it and then, you know, got away again. They, I mean, I have a lot of friends who started doing one thing and then just kind of just changed or pivoted, you know, a few years in and did something completely different. Uh, I had a friend of mine who I worked with for several years and he was a really, really great litigator. And then one day he decided, you know, I don't want to do this. I want to do like real estate transactional work. So, and he just decided to just completely change and went to a different firm and has been doing that since. And, you know, at the time I was like, but you're so good at this. <laughs> like, why would you change? But I'm sure he's equally as good at, you know, the, the new path, but there's nothing wrong in changing. I think it's hard, you know, and I was telling you earlier, you know, you just by seeking out, I mean, background, I mean, coming here to do, you know, to do a, a summer internship, especially after your first year. I mean, a lot of times people do that kind of stuff after their second year of law school. So, you know, you've got a leg up on a lot of, you know, students, because especially I know that law school applications apparently have gone up significantly during this time period. Um, but how is it that you found, you know, I think you said you were going even in person trying to look for, you know, opportunities to get some kind of a law experience. Yes, uh, I was trying to apply to jobs in person, but all the doors were locked <laughs> <laughs> and law offices are not their own structures anymore. So I got stuck in the lobby of a lot of tall buildings in Center City. You know, I love that, though. I, I had a colleague this is before law school that that's how he applied to jobs and he would just show up at their door and I at the time I was like are you crazy but it worked really really well for him because it was so different and and you automatically stand out because now that it's you're not just a piece of paper you're the person who the maybe crazy person who brought it to the door but you you made that extra effort I I don't know it's a way to get your resume not lost in the pile um, well, although also a way to get stuck in the lobby. I mean, <laughs> uh, if you do get in there, you can do fun little tricks. Like you can take your watch off and then just drop it on the ground and then say, <laughs> I have to come back to go get it. And that's kind of like a callback interview. I like this ingenuity. This is great. <laughs> that's what makes you a great legal mind. <laughs> Well, but I think there is an element of you have to think outside the box a little bit. Like I remember when I was applying to first year summer internship things. I mean, you would go to the career services and you would literally print out probably 80 cover letters, attach them to 80 resumes. And they had all these little boxes that you drop them in at the career services office and you would just hope for the best. And, and then inevitably you would get one mix, the wrong cover letter would go on the wrong thing or something, you know, there's some nonsense would happen, but 
that was just the old way of doing things. I think now, like, you know, n- not only have things changed, but moving into like this COVID type world that everything is just virtual and not virtual and, uh, you know, doors are locked. People aren't even in their offices. Like you have to think outside the box and be able to, you know, be like, what, what can I do to get, like, get someone to notice me and stand out from the pack? Yeah, I've gotten a couple of emails about the, uh, the OCI on campus interviewing thing. And that's the extent of that program that I've seen is just a couple of emails because that's where it's at right now. It's just emails you get and then mm-hmm. you send off a response email and attach your resume and then you get a similar Zoom uh, interview, I guess. But there's definitely it seems to be something lacking. Was it actually on campus interviewing before? I, I'm curious to ask you guys, like, did the people from the law firms come to the yeah. school campus? Oh, yeah, we it was did. a big deal. Yeah, we did had. It, did it look like had... a career fair where they all lined up in like a gymnasium? No, no. Oh. They would come Our... individually, like yeah. some of them would come individually. I actually talked to somebody who was very serious about doing maybe going into the JAG. And the reason being is that um, I could get my law school loans paid off. And for somebody who's paying their own student loans off, even as I sit here today, um, that was a big deal for me, especially I had some college you know, loans on there. And my whole thing, not that I didn't, you know, there's a litigation track for the JAG. It wasn't that I wasn't interested the eye opener was, is that you have no control over where they place you and it's for a time period. So I could be in somewhere remote in the Midwest United States. I'm from Pennsylvania. I went to school in New England, but I could be somewhere remote, you know, in the middle of Kansas or Oklahoma for five years or so and have, and I'd have to stay there. And I wasn't really keen on that. Um, also, there was a war going on, so I wasn't thought of maybe having to go to that would also kind of worried me a little bit. So I didn't, I didn't do it, but it was a very yeah. interesting inter like it wasn't an interview, but it was definitely an interesting meeting when I talked to them. Yeah. The, the way ours were set up is you would do all those things with your envelopes and things. And then the, the firms or DA's offices or public defender's office would choose their candidates to come in to interview. And at, I went to Villanova Law School, so they we were at the, the interviews were held at that time at like the mansion thing, and they would have like little sheets on the door. You would have a time slot for each interview you got chosen for, so you would all sit, you know, downstairs in the lobby area awkwardly with your classmates waiting for your time to be called to go up, and the and the walls are really thin, so you could hear other people talking, and it talk about like getting inside your head, like you're like, oh well, they're laughing in there, they must really like them, and then you have to go in after that. it was. It was a cattle call type situation. Um, so I, I mean, but I mean, that's how it was done. I don't know how, if that's how it works now. Um, I will say, I think, or advice I would give to you, even if you're looking for it or not, is getting involved now in your own, like building your own network and work LinkedIn um, as much as you can, because that's probably a better, I think, way to get your foot into the door to, to firms and get to know people and to get a job than doing the OCI and just being one of those people walking through the door in these cattle interviews. Yeah, I also say, I tell, I've told young attorneys this before COVID, um, I still tell people this, uh, Philadelphia Bar Association. I mean, my situation was a little different. I, I, at the time, I pretty much knew, at least by my third year, I knew I was coming back here. I wasn't going to stay up there in um, New England. My family, all my family was here. So I, my interviewing was a little different because I applied from up there. I had to send letters and, and then come home and do interviewing here. But um, go on the Philadelphia Bar Association's website. I, I know there will things that are going to still be remote somewhat. And then there are also going to be some things in person, but the uh, young lawyers division has events. Mm-hmm. Just go to one, you know, meet people, see what, who's out there, you know, it's um, get, get to know your network of who's going to be in your own bar association when you're out. If you stay in the, I mean, I think you're going to, I think we talked about this. I think you want to stay in this area, you know, yeah, but, no, certainly. Uh, but get to know your fellow, you know, um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Not compadres, but like your that works. I think I'm thinking contemporaries, <laughs> or you know, or but you know, get to know these networks because they are they are smaller than you think. Yeah, I and I remember what I did too when I so when I graduated, I, I summered at a, at a firm that they couldn't take on the summer class at all. Like they were just a smaller firm and they they hoped they could take on the summer class. There's only two of us. So the summer two and they couldn't. So I didn't have that. Oh, I had the second year job, that second summer job that I knew I was going to work at. So then I had to like hustle. And a lot, a lot of what I did is I went through my college alumni network and I kid you not, I tried to find every lawyer in the Philadelphia area that went to Georgetown and I would email them <laughs> and I just like, can we meet for coffee? And so many of them would. Um, and then they would find, talk to their friends and be like, they'd pass my resume along to them and they would get me an interview. And that worked. So, I mean, it got, at least got me so many interviews and meetings that I wouldn't have gotten just by sending a resume blindly. Cause I had already an in. Um, and now I think it's even easier with like with LinkedIn and then you already now summered at a firm, right? So now, mm -hmm. you know, everyone here and like, I wouldn't be shy about utilizing your network. And I say this to anyone listening, like utilize your network for everything that it's worth. Cause that's what it's for. And no, I, no one gets up. I, at least I don't, I don't ever get upset. If someone reaches out to me like, Hey, you know, can I pick your brain? I'm looking for a job. Do you know anything? I, I that doesn't bother me one bit. You know, mm -hmm. I'm always happy to help. I welcome it. Hence, Ted, while you're here, <laughs> you know, no, it was uh, somebody reached out to me, you know, and that's really, that's, I mean, my first job that I worked at out right out of law school, and I'm not ashamed to say this, I babysat one of the name partners' kids. <laughs> it was a that was my first job before, you know, I was babysitting, and that's how you use your network. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, like a good friend of mine, uh, she was on the podcast a few months ago, like she got her, her job by, she moved out to California with a dream, wanting to work out in California as an entertainment lawyer and, you know, but wasn't barred yet in California and started work doing just admin work for someone who was a lawyer in the entertainment business and worked her way in that way. And now as a name partner, no harm in that <laughs> just hustle, you got to hustle. <laughs> <laughs> and Ted, you seem to have that since considering like you're going in person to building yourself and like yeah. in person, that's a, like that take, not many people do that. Oh, Even wanna, before the pandemic, they didn't do that. I, I want to see the building. I want to see the physical <laughs> building where they spend all their time. This is important. People don't know this enough. They don't think about this, but like, where is it? Where in town is it? Is it on a busy street? Is it on my way to here? Is it on my way to there? I want to know that. Well, also, I mean, there's something to be said about going into an office and getting a feel for, for that office. Is, is there a receptionist? Is, are, are he or she nice? Like, you know, like, what does the office look like? <laughs> you know, do I want to work here? There's certain things that you might want to consider, you know, before, you know, getting there. Although it does, I think the outward appearance of office doesn't always translate into the experience that you may have there, but... <laughs> And our office is definitely not traditional. No. I can uh, say that because of, you know, we've worked, Megan's worked at other law firms. This definitely does, is not your typical law firm. No. Traditional one. And that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, what, well, I can't even ask about what about your friends because you don't, you don't make any friends. Are you just going to say he doesn't have any friends? That's horrible. Jeez. But well, there's lots of friends. No, I don't mean, like, you guys brought what me are you... here to roast me. <laughs> I, I meant more like what are the, what have any of your law school friends' experiences have been this summer? But you already told us that you really didn't make any friends. This, the only students. people I know who are also at law school right now are the people I went to high school with. And how, how is their experience compared to yours? Has it been the same, different? It seems uh, basically the same, maybe a couple differences, like one would be more online, one was a little less online, but even still when it's in person, just the atmosphere is different. And like, there's still not gonna be a presence of the school in the building. Like if you have class in person, you're really just there and you're grateful that you have that but then you leave. And I don't think it'd be comparable to 
prior years where you go from somewhere in the building and you chit chat over down to the hall and you go to class and then you come out and hang around school and go to the next class. There's none of that. Yeah. Oh, people had lunch. It's like, you know, like when you went to undergrad or you went to, you know, high school and stuff, people had breakfast, like for the early people who like to get there early, they would, there were little breakfast groups or whatever. And, um, people who didn't, who had like, depending on what their class schedule was, stayed for lunch. You know, you ate lunch at the same, like our law, my law school had like a whole downstairs, like, yeah, uh, I wouldn't say cafeteria, because it's not really a cafeteria type thing, but something similar to that. Oh, we had a cafeteria, like, like, oh, high, so like high Vill- school style. The Villanova Law School Dining Hall is famous amongst the undergraduate <laughs> population. The old one or the new one? Because I, I was think... there at the old building. <laughs> oh, you weren't in, in uh, I mean, the new building, yeah. yeah Were you there was... when it was still in Gary? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's yeah. a terrible building. That <laughs> I building know. has classrooms that don't have any windows. I know. I went to them. I was in oh, them. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, but I came out okay. I wasn't tan, but I came out okay. <laughs> It would hurt my eyes. I'd go to class in those buildings and just like all four white walls and then the fluorescent lighting, my eyes would start tearing up after like 80 minutes in there. Yeah. I mean, we had lockers. It was like a, it was really like a high school, a very small high school. It's very strange. I don't know if there's lockers at other law schools, but that seemed odd to me. You wouldn't know either, Ted. <laughs> I've never been in a law school. <laughs> Only when I went to go get breakfast at Villanova was I in a law school. So what made you decide on Drexel? I wanted to stay local. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Drexel's really like grown and blossomed. Like I remember, my, I remember one a, a girl, one of my first firms. She did her summer summer associate thing at my firm, and then you know started working there. And she was the first graduating class from Drexel. And now I think it's like, I mean, I think it's flown up the ranks, and just I think has just gotten like it has a really great reputation. Yeah, it's the, it Klein, is, uh, the Klein School of Law now. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's that's correct. I think it's 15 okay. years old. So this school yeah. is a 15 year old. The yeah. school is. Yeah, it's new. Um, it's interesting. So, so it's up. To, it's not a secret. It's on the website. But Tom Klein, the local um, huge attorney around here, he actually went to my undergrad, and I happened to be looking at something. I think like somebody was talking to me about homecoming this year at my undergrad, and on there, I didn't realize they have sort of like an early admissions type program from my undergrad hmm. with Klein School of Law, which I think is great. I mean, yeah. we had a pre-law society at my undergrad, but not anything like, we didn't have that kind of connection. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, yeah, I know he's pretty involved. Uh, I had, he, we would have Zoom calls with them. We would talk to the entering class and we were told if it was a normal year, he'd be there and he'd come speak. And some classes, even they'd bring him in to talk and like the, just the basic tort class Mm -hmm. was, uh, was Tom Klein talking to a bunch of 22 year olds. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So you, do you have a few weeks before you have to start? August 20th is the big back to school bash where they said we're going to have all the orientation events that we never got oh. there's going to be tours of the school offered for people who need a tour around uh that should be the kickoff to the new year and the new experience so you have like about a week before then so what are you what are you going to do with all your free time you're going to go on a big trip you know get some sleep what's your plan probably just do some research on lexus for fun <laughs> I'm just gonna look up people I know and like <laughs> things I see. <laughs> I mean, I enjoyed that. I'll keep doing it. Um, Sounds like up? an exciting way to spend <laughs> the rest of your summer. <laughs> oh yeah, it's gonna be good. Eat some bland meals too. <laughs> I'll have some white bread, just that, and some water. I love hitting up Nexus, Lexus, though. Uh, look, looking up Villanova and looking up Drexel, <laughs> looking up the schools I went to. And go to. Oh, well, yeah, there are some. Uh, well, there's that one. There's a one famous Villanova case um, that pops up a lot, at least for me. Premises case. Um, I, I have not come across a Drexel case, but the Villanova one comes up all the time. 
Mm. I don't think I know what you're talking about, so I'll have to I'll have to keep Wait. digging. It's a, it's a real doozy. <laughs> I, think okay. I think it's a hills and ridges case, if I remember correctly. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't think. Do you know what hills and ridges is, Ted? No. Oh. Yeah. Is, this, is this a geographic feature? <laughs> no, I'll explain it to you after the podcast. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's something like that. No, it, it, it's not as exciting as you think, but <laughs> no, it's it's not. Yeah. No, it involves snow yeah. and when you move it versus not move it and oh. it's liable. <laughs> <laughs> I, I come across it quite a bit. Um, well, you know, I, I'm so glad that you, you came on. Do you have any advice for Wendy and I how to make, you know, a summer experience better or, or any, for someone else? Should we do it again? Should, what, what do you think? Yeah, you guys should... Uh, if there's another pandemic <laughs> that okay. makes the whole world shut down and in a hundred years it happens all again, you should do the exact same program. <laughs> I'd say that because I, I, I don't even know how to give recommendations for the future because I think this situation was so unique. I liked it. I think it was a product of the circumstances. I really enjoyed it. Um, but I bet I it would be entirely of, different next year. I did a lot of forewarning beforehand because again, I said, you know, usually you know, when people had summer programs, it wasn't just going to court and doing, you know, the observing and uh, doing the research. You actually had events, you know, you basically yeah. you'd take people out to the Phillies game or, you know, yeah. do other things. And that's, it's really hard when there's, that's very limited. At these, oh, these well, I got a Pepsi today. That was pretty good. <laughs> How long has it because, been there? <laughs> huh? It was brand new. I bought it today. Oh, oh okay. We had a little farewell pizza party for Ted. Oh, okay. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we used to do a lot more lunches, but I, I and it's funny, we still have firm lunches like on our calendar and I just laugh because I'm like, who's the, no, there's no one going. <laughs> we're <laughs> least, here. Yeah, maybe, maybe some we're people. Here. We do. We do it a little bit. We've, we've done some lunches this summer, Ted. Ted oh, got yeah, to definitely. try falafel. I had him try Yes, boys. I tried falafel for the first time. Oh. It's okay. <laughs> It's not but you don't really okay. have anything to compare to, though. That's the thing. I didn't love it. And I didn't hate it. I did thought you, it was. Did good. you go to Goldie or did you go someplace else? Yes, Goldie. that place. Oh yeah, no, it was. That's delicious falafel. That's the best one around. It was. It was, it was good. <laughs> did you have a milkshake? Did you have a tahini? Milkshake? I did. I liked yeah. the uh, the coffee milkshake. Was pretty good. Yeah. See, those I can't get behind. I think they're gross, but the falafels are delicious. <laughs> Um, well, Ted, thank you so much for spending your summer with us and bear, bearing with us in these weird circumstances. I'm so glad you reached out to Wendy and, you know, she, she had this great idea to bring you over. Um, and, you know, thanks for coming on the podcast and, you know, sharing your experiences. Um, you know, just love sitting down talking to you. Um, mm -hmm. so, Hey Paul, um, <laughs> <laughs> But, and I encourage you to, you know, after, you know, you leave to keep, you know, keep us in, keep contact with us. You use us as, you know, you're starting your network as, you know, you navigate the next, next year and your opportunities for next summer. Oh, sure. Absolutely. And, and I say that to any, anyone listening, if there are any of your classmates listening or any other law students, you know, network, 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 you know, and, you know, if you want to start your network with, you know, people who are on this podcast, I encourage you to do that too. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to reach out to all the listeners. I'm going to tell them all to email all me. <laughs> reach out to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thanks so much for coming on. And for, again, for all our listeners, if you like what you hear, please uh, subscribe to the podcast on uh, Apple podcast. And also we're on YouTube at the legal navigator. Thanks, Ted. Uh, thank you, Ted. Thank you.